Hello, and welcome. I'm Daughter of Darkness, your narrator. Tonight, I have for you Part 2 of Diaries from Hell. When last we heard, the demon had caused painful and expensive injuries to our hapless hero and his mother by throwing them down the entryway stairs, thus draining their savings and preventing the family from moving and escaping its clutches. Let's dive right into these stories. So sit back, relax, let me lead the way, and let's get scared together, together, together. December 1988 I recovered quicker than my mother from the September experience, but with the holidays coming up, everyone is feeling a bit better. My uncle and I decorated outside of the house. Plastic toy soldiers, giant plastic candles, strings of lights, and a life-size plastic Santa. We put them on a wide ledge outside of our living room window on the second floor. We secured it to the ledge and plugged it in, making sure that there were no tensions in the extension cord. On Christmas Eve, my uncle threw a huge Christmas party down in his apartment. Hours before the party was set to end, a younger cousin exclaimed, I hear Santa's footsteps. Sure enough, we all heard loud footsteps overhead, in our empty apartment. Then. The room broke out into peals of screams as right outside my uncle's large picture window, that Santa swung back and forth, the extension cord wrapped around its plastic neck. My father and I bolted upstairs, determined to save the young kids from thinking that Santa had hung himself, and we knew that he was situated right outside of our picture window, on the ledge. I reached the stairwell door, and to my surprise, the door was closed and locked. I fumbled around for my key and opened it. Inside, all of the lights were off. I grabbed a flashlight and shone it down the hallway. The hallway rug was pulled back and bunched up against the living room door. We opened the door to the living room and it took a moment for my father and I to register what we saw. The window was wide open and the plastic Santa gone. But the plastic sheet over the window was still intact and sealed to the window frame. Explanation from Narrator In colder states, winters are brutal. We have something akin to shrink wrap that we put on windows to insulate them. Also, the poster told me that these particular windows were original to the building. In the winter, the wooden frames would shrink and they would not stay open unless you prop them up with something. So the fact that the window was open at all behind the still intact plastic was weird enough. But add to that the fact that the window was wide open without anything holding it into place, and you've got yourself an extra heap in helping of weirdness served up for Christmas dinner. Now, back to the story. We tore the plastic off, pulled Santa up, and secured him back into place. There was no wind or ice. How did it fall? Dad went to get more plastic, and he told me to get the hair dryer. Upon my return, I forgot about the bunched-up hallway runner, and it tangled around my feet and tripped me. As I fell, I thought I saw someone in the stairwell. But when I stood up, no one was there. I gave the hair dryer to Dad, and about ten minutes later, we had the window sealed up again. The stairwell door banged once. Then, we heard another door bang. I assume it was the basement. We returned to the party, and I explained to my uncle privately what happened. The party had come to an early end. The change in the house is like entering the eye of a storm. It's suddenly calm and peaceful. But you know, it's only temporary. End of entry. February 1989 
Things have changed in the house, again, and not for the better. Since the new year, I've noticed that my dad is staying awake longer and later into the night. He's always been a light sleeper, but he always went to bed between 10 and 10.30 p.m. and got up for work around 3.30 a.m. But now I hear him up, and it's just past midnight. The weird thing is, I've seen him standing in the dining room in the dark, staring into my room. I've also seen him in the hallway looking into the kitchen, just standing there in the dark. One night, he was in my room, just watching me sleep. I woke up and tried to talk with him, but he wouldn't respond. Just shake his head slowly, side to side, as if to say, no. Then, he snapped out of it and just went to bed. I've tried talking to him about this, but he says he doesn't remember. March, 1989. Dad is still doing that standing around in the dark thing. I'm getting worried. Mom doesn't remember him even getting up, so I'm thinking he's not even going to bed at all. Sunday, in the middle of the night, I found him in the kitchen in the dark with something in his hand. I backed off and went back to my room. I heard him drop something in the sink later before going to bed. In the morning, I saw it was a kitchen knife. I made sure to move the knives into a different cabinet after that. Later that night. Tonight around 7, Dad fell asleep on the couch and was having a bad dream. He was talking in his sleep, muttering, They're coming. They're coming. They're here. I tried to wake him, and as I did, his hand shot up and grabbed me by the throat. His hand felt like ice. I pounded on his forearm, but it was like punching concrete. His other hand was right in my face, fingers curled up as if he was holding something. His fingers flexed, and then he snapped out of it, pulled me in for a hug, and apologized. Dad never shows open affection, and never apologizes. I asked him what was going on, and he told me, he would tell me one day, but not today. Mom will be home soon. Tonight is her late night at work. I moved the knives to a different cabinet. Again. April, 1989. My dad just woke up from a nap, sweating and having trouble breathing. He's complaining about something inside of him hurting and he needs help. Mom took him to the emergency room. The house is eerily quiet, literally and figuratively. Hours passed by, and my mother called, crying. She told me my father had a heart attack. She's staying with him now. My grandfather is coming to take me to see him. When we arrived at the hospital, Dad was awake but headed for surgery. He spent eight days in the hospital, a couple weeks more on home rest. Looks like our days of pepperoni pizzas are over. But the good news? There's been no more standing around in the dark, and he goes to bed at 9.30 now. I'm just glad to have my dad back, even if it did cost us the last of our savings for moving out of this house. God, I hate this house. End of Entry Additional Notes from the Current Day Poster my father never told me what he was dreaming about. It's likely that this fell into the category of things he didn't want me to know that he did. My guess is that it had something to do with his army experience. He had started watching the show Tour of Duty almost religiously. It was after he passed away that I discovered he was a Vietnam vet. Whatever he did in the service obviously stayed with him. June, 1989. I really don't know what's going on with this house. Dad has recovered well. We go fly fishing and Mom goes out with friends or visits my grandmother. Basically, we try to be home as little as possible. 
Mom said something tried to push her down the stairs again. She caught the handrail and didn't fall, but did get a gnarly bruise on her shoulder. This kind of freaked her out because it hasn't been all that long ago that I played a human wrecking ball, throwing us both down the stairs. My dad, uncle, and grandfather have been working on a project upstairs and have included me. We're building an Irish pub in the attic. The pool table and bar have been there since we moved in, but Grandpa and Uncle Jay are great woodworkers, so we're customizing it. We have a handmade plaque that reads, Sullivan's Pub, Ireland watches over all who cross this threshold. We hung it up over the entrance to the attic. Something is not happy about that pub. We have to use the back staircase to get to the attic, and every time we carry up bags, they split open. Plastic toad handles snap off, and the cold radiating from the basement door is so strong you can sometimes see your breath in the air. July 1989 We're starting to hear animal noises and there are scratches, deep scratches being left on the floors and the walls near the attic door. The scratches are always in groups of three. The wall has been pounded on in the night. My closet is once again creaking open, despite the hook and eye lock on it, and I make sure that it is closed every night. Now I'm starting to see something walk past my door in the early morning hours. And it's huge. It blocks out the street lights from the living room windows, and there's a smell to it, like wet moss and old copper pennies, like in the basement. There are also scratches on the inside of my closet door and the walls in there as well. I've been seeing eyes outside of my window at night, they could be from the old barn owl, but it's never sat there looking into my window all night. My friends don't come around at all anymore. They say even standing on the porch makes them feel unsafe. End of entry. August 1989. Morning. It's hot and humid. My mom left for a trip with her sisters. She's headed up north where it's a lot cooler. Lucky. So it's just me and Dad for the weekend. We had a day of playing pool and watching old movies together, and generally just trying to stay out of the sun. Afternoon. By noon, it had to have been pushing 100 degrees. It's so hot outside. My uncle installed an old AC window unit in the pub. It's good enough to take some of the heat and humidity out of the room. Dad and I listened to Gaelic tunes and played some pool. The attic has become an oasis. Nothing bad ever seems to happen up there. It seems to be a safe haven, a place that, for whatever reason, is beyond the reach of that thing that inhabits the house. Maybe that's why it doesn't want us building up there. When you enter the attic, Something will bang on the door as if it's trying to get in. The finish on the wood door keeps getting scratched, and there's pounding in the walls. The area around the door started to smell. At first, the smell was like the basement, wet moss and pennies. Then, it got real bad, like rotting food and body odor. After shooting pool and hanging out with my uncle, we headed down to our apartment. Upon entering, we heard a high-pitched beeping. Turned out to be my father's weather alert receiver. A severe thunderstorm and tornado watch were issued for this afternoon into the early morning hours. Nightfall. Dad and I spent the better part of the evening watching old movies. We could see the flashes of lightning off in the distance, almost like strobe lights. Our shows were interrupted by a weather report that we had been upgraded from a watch to a warning. We both realized how bad this could be. If a tornado did come, we would have to head down to the basement. At night, during a storm, 
knowing what was down there. We could hear the thunder rolling and see the flashes of lightning getting brighter. First white, then it became green. I had been glancing towards my room when the lightning flashed. I saw that the closet was wide open. My father asked me if I saw green when the lightning flashed. Before I could answer him, the lightning flashed purple. I looked into my room. The closet was closed. More lightning. I looked, and the closet door flew open so hard it hit the wall and the doorknob was embedded into the drywall. The next day. I'm writing this the following morning, in the safety of daylight. I never want to go through what happened last night again. I'm hoping that my memory is accurate. I'm sure this will haunt my dreams for years to come. Here's what I remember. The lightning cut out the power. The house went black, except for flashes of green and purple lightning and the sound of constantly rolling thunder. Dad asked me to get the extra candles and the flashlight from the kitchen. I remember leaving the living room and going into the hallway. The lightning was flashing and the thunder was so loud, they were both nearly constant. The heart of the storm must have been just over us. The wind picked up and started howling like a pack of wolves. I could see into the kitchen and the door to the back staircase that leads to the basement was wide open. It was locked earlier. I know it was locked because I locked it. Then something stepped out of the bathroom. I thought it was my father teasing me, so I said, nice try, not funny. What was in front of me was big, but as the lightning flashed, I saw it rise to its full height. The hallway is at least eight feet high and four feet wide, and this thing took up most of it as I couldn't see past it into the kitchen. This entity was bigger and wider than my father, and suddenly a hand was on my shoulder from behind, pulling me back, and my father said, that's not me, boy. I could not look away as my father pulled me back. The entity was black. Even in the lightning, it was black as could be. It had long, thick arms and hands that I can only describe as having hawk-like talons. It had a massive head, and the lightning would reflect back from three points, one higher up, centered, and the other two where you would expect eyes to be. So it looked like it had three eyes. It tilted its head like a dog, hearing a high-pitched sound. And then, it started to move its head side to side, till it was moving like a blur, and only the color of the lightning flashing reflected. It started to move towards us. My father pulled me back. A howl came from the entity that sounded like every kind of animal you know mixed together. It gouged at the walls near the pantry door. When it howled, the area under its eyes grew even darker. My father flung me into the living room, stepped inside and slammed the door behind him. We lit all the candles that we had in the living room. The light from them cast shadows on the wall, but these shadows moved differently than the flickering of the flames. It was as if they were scurrying under the door to get away from the light. As the storm raged outside, that thing in the hallway kept slamming up against the closed doors. The living room was closed off, so Dad opened a window. We would jump if we had to. The pounding on the doors and the walls continued, and the shadows kept coming back at us from under the door, only to shrink back when the candlelight hit them. My dad took the mirror down from the wall and put it behind the candles to get more light reflecting towards the door and keep the shadows at bay. The animal sounds continued to get louder. That thing was walking up and down the hallway, growling. The storm raged a while longer. 
It felt like hours, but the power was out, so we had no idea what time it was. We kept waiting for that thing in the hallway to break through the door, but it never did. The candles burned all night. The storm passed, and the smell of wet grass and fresh air replaced the ozone smell. All became quiet in the house, except for the dripping of water. End of entry. The next day. As I write this, I'm honestly thankful that we made it through the storm and the night. First off, Mom is okay. No storms up her way. She'll be home later, though, after she learned about the storm damage here. The wind brought down a good part of the old oak tree in the backyard. It hit the AC window unit in the attic and tore the window and the frame out. We salvaged what we could in the attic, notably my grandfather's plaque, but a lot of the woodworking that was done was lost to wind, rain, and hail. The ceilings in our apartment are damaged from the rain that came in through the attic, so they'll need to be replaced. In my room, the door to the closet was indeed opened so forcefully that the hinges are partially torn out of the frame and the doorknob was embedded into the drywall. I think I hear whispers coming from my closet, saying, Come down. I tried recording it, but it's too soft. In the hallway, there are three deep gashes in the drywall. The entity that did this likely could have palmed my entire head without difficulty. That afternoon... My uncle came upstairs, and I swear he looked so much older than he did just yesterday. After making sure everyone was okay, he looked at the hallway walls. It was here, wasn't it? My uncle asked, and we could only nod our heads. Come on, lads. He motioned for us to follow him down the back stairs to the first floor. The door to his living area was pushed in, wood splinters everywhere. The basement door was crushed outward, not inward like you would expect from a storm, but outward. The door to the backyard was wide open. Another large branch from the oak tree came down apparently. A neighbor's cat was sitting there sunning itself. I had always given her food and water when I saw her, so she came to me to get some food. When she got near the basement door though, there was an odd animal sound coming from the dark basement, followed by the same breathy whisper that I heard in my closet. Come down. This time, I'm positive that I could hear a whispered voice. The cat must have heard it too, because she crouched down, arched her back, hissed, and ran off. I continued to hear the whisper of, Come down, come see from the dark, open basement. I heard it. I know I did. And from the furtive glances they were giving one another, I know my dad and uncle heard it too. My uncle came upstairs to see what damage could be covered by the insurance companies and what would not, before heading out to get lumber and plaster. Evening. We boarded up my closet door and then we helped my uncle board up the attic window. It felt violated in the attic, like all of the joy and hard work was lost. To make matters worse, the taunting whispering could be heard as we put the last screw into the plywood. See you. Dad and I agreed not to tell Mom about the entity. Dad spoke with my mother and they both decided to pick up extra shifts on the weekend. They are determined to have enough money for us to move by next year. In the meantime, I'll stay the weekends with my grandparents. End of entry. Note from present day poster. We now move ahead 21 years. My father had been diagnosed with cancer and we spent long hours visiting in his final days, and our talk eventually turned to what happened in that house all those years ago. August 2010 
This is the first day of hospice care, and I'm visiting my father. He has three months at most. During my visits, he decided to show me some Ghost Hunter series that he started watching on TV. We watched a couple of episodes, and then he decided it was time to talk. Our conversation went like this. Dad, not like our old apartment, huh? Me, oh no, nothing like that. Dad, so you know it was an old funeral parlor, right? Me, what was? Our old apartment? Dad, your uncle's floor was for the viewing, and our floor was the funeral director's living space. That closet of yours, that is where the lift was that was used to get the bodies up and down from the basement. You never worked that one out? Me. Uh, no. It kind of explains a lot. Dad. Oh, yeah. Creepy shit started happening weeks after we moved in. Minor stuff, like windows opening, doors banging. But when you got older, you started talking to a man that wasn't there. Me. What the? Dad. Go through the photo albums that you have for Mom. I think there are a few that we took of you, and there's a white mist surrounding you. Me. I thought that was cigarette smoke. Dad. Nope. We were too poor to move. My parents couldn't take us in, and, well, your mom's mother? I would rather naked wrestle a horny porcupine than swim in a pool of Purell than live with that woman. That was an actual quote that my father had about his mother-in-law. Me. Thanks for the visual, Dad. Dad. You're welcome, boy. So the apartment was all we had. You used to talk about the adventures that this invisible old man said you would have and the treasure that you would find in a cave. Me. Yeah, okay, I don't recall any of that. Dad. You were just a little shit then. Now you're a big shit. Shut up and listen. The cave was the name that you had for that area under the stairwell in the basement. You know the one. Me. Wait, I hated that room. Dad. Yeah, that's because that's where you first saw the shadow. That was Uncle Jay's word for it. From that point on, it was heads under the blanket, monsters in the closet, and you stopped talking to the old man because you thought he wanted to hurt you. Me. You're creeping me out now. Dad. Yeah, well, it gets worse. The treasure that you spoke of was actually a safe that was built into the foundation. Uncle Jay did some checking into the background of the funeral guy. Not a good man. Fifth generation asshat businessman and a convicted con man to boot. He was known for slipping valuables off the deceased and into that safe. His partner notified the authorities when he learned of it. Me. Why did Uncle Jay buy that place? Dad. Dirt cheap real estate, boy. Our Uncle Jay never believed this stuff until after we moved in and the activity increased. Anyway, after things started happening, Uncle Jay went into the basement where he stashed a trunk of odds and ends that he had found when he moved in. And he found a set of old ledgers from the original owner. The last entry said, I'm done. The rat bastard turned me in. Family legacy gone to shit. May the devil take him and anyone who comes into this house hereafter. That night, according to Uncle Jay, both the funeral director and his partner vanished. The house went to some nephew who renovated it into a multifamily home. It sat on the market for a long time, and your aunt and uncle snapped it up cheap. When Aunt G's friend heard that it was a funeral home, she was all gung-ho to have a seance and bring in all of her Miss Cleo-type psychic friends. Things got so bad that Uncle Jay had a priest come in and bless the house. Things quieted down for a while. Then we had the break-in. The doors were damaged, and because of that, the blessing was vacated. 
and that thing came back, seething mad. You mean you never once wondered why we always had you staying at your grandparents? And why Mom and I were working all those weekends? It wasn't until you got older that you really started to notice things. Me. No, I never worked that one out. I just thought you were saving money. What did it look like to you? For me, it was big and shrouded, and it had three eyes and hands like hawk talons. Dad. For me, it was big, three eyes, long horns pointing forward, clawed hands, and it was darker than dark. After that night with the storm, we were leaving come hell or high water. We got lucky. We got the cash together for a down payment and got out. Your mother had the new house blessed, and your grandfather carved and buried four stones for luck and protection. You know, I would see that damn thing in the trees outside of our property sometimes. It took Uncle Jay, you know that, right? I would see it from time to time. I saw it the night you moved out, and on the nights leading up to your mom's passing. And now, it wants me to know it's waiting for me. End of entry. My father passed one month later. We never spoke of the encounter again. This brings us to the end of part two of Diaries from Hell. I'd like to thank you for listening and a special thanks to David Sullivan for giving his permission to share his journal entries with all of you. He told me he's been in touch with his cousins and the current owner of his old home. So who knows, there may be a part three somewhere down the line. If you enjoyed this week's video, share, like, subscribe, and comment below. All of these things really help to grow the channel and we can continue to meet here every week in the dark. So, until next time, stay scared, my friends.